sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. Naval intelligence tells you that two Marines have been picked up with the shore patrol. They're reported sick. One is in critical condition. Foul play is suspected. Your job? Investigate. Here's what leading tobacco publications have had to say about king-size Chesterfield. U.S. Tobacco Journal, Atlanta, Georgia. Chesterfield king-size is going strong. One jobber reordered twice this week in addition to his regular order. And the Chicago Weekly, Tobacco Leaf, reports more calls for Chesterfield king-size cigarettes than for most brands being marketed. The reason for king-size Chesterfield's amazing success is this. All king-size cigarettes give you quantity, but only Chesterfield king-size gives you quantity plus quality, premium quality. That means Chesterfield king-size contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king-size cigarette. The same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. Enough more of this tobacco to give you over a fifth longer smoke. So remember... Chesterfield is the only cigarette to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. Buy them either way you like them. Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Much milder. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, July 10th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Lorman. My name's Friday. It was 7.58 a.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Morning, Joe. Hi. Just get in? Yeah. Anything in the book? I'm looking. What's the matter? Are you hacked about something? No, no. Why do you ask that? Well, figures you're sore about something. What do you do? Take a sour pill? You keep this up, you won't be asked to post for toothpaste ads. Well, now, that's funny. All right, Joe. Tell your Uncle Dudley. What's the matter? Not a said court deal yesterday. It was miserable. Hmm. Thing you and Gaffney been working out? Yeah, the white glove band. It came up while you were out on vacation. Spent over a month on it. Covered it from every angle. Yeah. It looked like we had the guy any way he turned. We had an idea how much he'd taken on each job. Lee thought he traced him on every move he made on each of the deals. We figured we really had the guy. DA's office thought so, too. They quit him? Yeah. Let him walk right out. Twelve men, good and true. Let that cheap hoodlum walk right out on the streets a free man. Well, that's where it goes sometimes. Mm. Is there Mr. Friday here? Yes, sir. I'm Friday. Is something I can do for you? Well, I'm Richard Houston, Naval Intelligence. Deputy Chief Brown directed me to you. I see. Well, it's my partner, Frank Smith. Lieutenant Houston. Hello, Hello, Smith. Smith. Like, sit down, sir. What is it we can do for you? Well, we got a weird one. That's why we thought your department ought to be in on it. About all I can tell you is just the skeleton of the thing. We don't know all the details. We haven't gone into it completely yet. We figured you fellas would like to be in on it from the beginning. Looks like it's going to be a police investigation. Yes, sir. To begin, I should go back three weeks ago and tell you the story as near as we've been able to reconstruct it. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Well, a couple of Marines left the base. They'd just gotten back from Korea, both on a 48-hour pass. We figured they came up here to L.A., they had a lot of back pay in their pockets. We don't know where they started, but they ended up in a cheap hotel. We got a call from the shore patrol early Monday morning. They'd gotten a complaint that the two boys were causing a disturbance in the hotel. They picked them up and found they both were in a pretty bad way. They had them shipped to the naval hospital down at Long Beach. By the time they got there, they were really rocky. Well, I'm sorry, sir, but I don't quite see just how we're connected with this. Well, I'm getting to that. I'm sorry. It's all right, I'm a little long-winded. Anyway, last night, the boys had been AWOL for over two weeks. They were brought into the hospital, like I said. Doctors did what they could, but it was too late to help. One of the boys died late last night. We're not sure about the other one. That's where you come in, sir. They were both poisoned. Nine oh six a.m. Frank and 
I talked with Captain Lorman, then we checked out a trip car and left for Long Beach. When we got there, we talked with the doctor in charge. He told us that it would be later that night before the boy would be completely out of danger. He said, however, that we could talk to him if we phrased our questions so that the answers could be kept fairly brief. We looked over the boy's record. His full name was Jack Wayne Walker, age 24. He'd enlisted in the Marine Corps on January 14, 1950. He'd spent almost a year in the Far East, and his service record had been good until this time. The record of the victim, PFC Edward Monahan, was pretty much the same. The boys had both come from the same town in Arkansas. The date of their enlistment was the same. They'd served overseas the same time. At 3.48 p.m., the doctor ushered us into Jack Walker's room. Who are you? Police officers, Jack. We'd like to talk to you. Well, what's it about? I haven't done anything. At least I don't think I did. No, it's not that. We'd like to find out what happened while you were up in L.A. Well, I killed my buddy up there. That's what happened. You heard about that, didn't you? Yes, we did. That's what we want to talk to you about. Poor Ed. A year in Korea. Guys taking pot shots at us. Cold, mud. And we've got to come back here to get it. I didn't trust that little crumb. I knew we shouldn't have had anything to do with it. Well, you shouldn't have trusted who, Jack? Stubby. You know the rest of his name? No, just Stubby. I just can't believe it about Ed. He shoved off L.A. going to have a last fling. Ed was getting married as soon as we got home. All right, if you could just start right at the beginning. Oh, well, sure. Well, first, we both had a 48-hour pass. We figured to go to L.A., like I said, for last fling. A few drinks, look at some of the lights, have a little fun. Sort of a bachelor party for Ed before he got hitched, mm-hmm. you know? Well, we pulled into town. Let's see. I, I think it was Saturday morning. Uh, a couple of buddies told us about a joint up there where we could have some fun. Yeah. Well, we head up there. and Nice little place that hour in the morning. I guess about uh, 10, 1030. Well, we start in to drink. It gets pretty foggy after that. Like little parts in a jigsaw, you know. Mm. You sort of see a little bit of everything, but the whole picture ain't there. Yeah. Well, I remember we hung around the place for two days, and then it all really goes black. Next thing I remember, we woke up in some flea bag. I remember looking at the calendar on the wall. We was already a couple days AWOL. Ed and I talked about what we should do. Mm-hmm. And then we get to trying to think up an excuse for the CO for being AWOL. And with our CO, it ain't easy. He's had experts try it. Ed says he figured out something, so we start for the bus depot, get back to base. On the way, we pass this bar, and Ed says, well, maybe we ought to stop and have one more for the road, so we do, and... I don't remember much for a couple more days. Mm-hmm. And I remember once we stopped and watched a guy get tattooed. Ed and I got talking about it, you know, whether or not we should have it done. Finally, I figured it was kind of kid stuff, so we didn't. I remember that because it was right after we left the tattoo place, went to this bar where we met Stubby. Now, this is the fellow that you were talking about? Isn't yeah, it's him. And you met him in a bar? Isn't uh-huh, right? yeah. Ed and I were sitting there trying to figure out what was going to do, you know. We were pretty broke by this time, and then, too, we was over two weeks AWOL. Anyway, sliced that we had big trouble. Yeah. Well, we walked into this place. It was about 4.35 or 5 in the afternoon. At least near as I can tell, that's about what time it was. The uh, whole deal gets kind of foggy. We sat down at this bar and ordered a drink. And just sitting there minding our own business, trying to figure what we ought to do. And then this stubby joker comes up, sits down next to Ed, brings a drink with him. He was in the bar when you came in, is that right? Yeah. Well, at least I think so. I didn't pay much attention, but he had a drink when he came up to Ed and me. Yeah, go ahead. Well, he got to talk about the core, and next thing we know, he's setting up the drink. Mm-hmm. The way we was fixed as long as he wanted to buy, we wasn't going to argue. Mm-hmm. Did they seem to know this stubby in the bar? Yeah, the girl that waits on tables called him my name. All right, you want to go ahead? Yeah, well, this stubby kept going on about how he liked the core and how he'd won a whole flock of citations in Korea. Told us all about the time he'd spent in Japan. First, we thought he was just throwing a bunch of coconuts at us, but we'd ask him about places in Korea and... Things you could only know if you was there. He'd come up with the answers all right, but even with all that, there was something that just didn't ring true with it. Yeah. Anyway, long about 8 or 8.30 that night, Stubby got in a thrash with the bartender, something about the price of the drink, so he suggested we go up to his place and get a jug, you know, and drink up there. Well, I wasn't too hot for the idea, but Ed said we had nothing to lose. And we didn't have a sack for the night, and there wasn't much dough left, so we shoved off with him. Where did Stubby live? A hotel down on 5th. I'll tell you how to find the place. Same place you were picked up in? Yeah. We got the address then. Oh, okay. Well, what happened when you got Stubby's room? Well, we cracked the jug, sat around drinking for a while, and then Ed and I went to sleep. Mm-hmm. I tell you, the next morning we had the biggest hangovers in the entire United States and Canada, both of us. We felt miserable. Ed started beefing about the cheap booze Stubby had rung in on us. That's when he tried to tout us on them pills. What pills are those? Oh, them things supposed to relieve hangovers. 
Oh, you mean the kind they sell in drugstores? Oh, no, no, damn. Uh, Stubby told us about that one. Uh, he'd come back to the States. He'd stood some duty in a hospital and said that while he was there, he got them pills. Said they was a special prescription that they was great for head shrinking. He wanted us to try them. Well, did you? Well, no, not right away. He kept after us, though, kidding us about being big, tough Marines with a hangover. And then he took one of the pills, leastwise we thought he did. So Ed and I figured then we didn't have anything to lose. You took one of these hangover pills then, did you? Yeah, we both did. Mm -hmm. What happened then? Well, nothing right away. Stubby said take a little time for it to take effect. We got up and started to get dressed. And Ed and I thought we'd better get back to the base, you know. We'd probably be in enough trouble as it was without worrying about a hangover. Yeah. You left the room? No, we was just getting our stuff together and Ed took sick. Said he had an awful pain in the stomach like a cramp, you know. And we asked Stubby if the pill could have caused it. He said no. It must have been the booze. Yeah. Well, right about then, I was getting ready to mop up the place with this stubby. I figured, sure, he'd given us a mickey. I couldn't figure why, though. And then it hit me. That felt, huh? Yeah, I guess so. Real bad cramps in my stomach. I got real dizzy. The room started to go around. And we asked the stubby to call a doctor, and that's when we knew he was really in trouble. How's that? Well, we knew then he was nuts off his trolley. And neither of us could walk. It had doubled up and passed out, and I could hardly keep awake. We both just lay there on the floor. I kept asking this bum to get us a medic. Mm -hmm. Did he? No, he just stood there and laughed at us. Laughed like a crazy fool. He kept saying we was big, strong Marines. We should be able to take a little stomach ache without running to a doctor. At no time did he make any attempt to get your medical help? No, no I, just like I said, he just stood there and laughed at us. Then he got real mean. Got crazy leer on his face. Said he'd show us that he'd fix us up good for what we'd done. Well, what do you mean by that? I don't know. All I thought about was getting Ed and me to a doc. About this time, I didn't much care what the little screwball did. Then it really started hopping on how he's getting even with us. I tried to get at him. I'd have killed him if I could have. I, I tried to get at him, but I fell and went out, I guess. And that's when he said that thing about that we wouldn't be the last ones he'd get. Huh? Well, he said like this, you guys are the first, just the first. But there's going to be more, a lot more. <laughs> continued to talk to Jack Walker. He gave us a complete description of the man he'd known as Stubby. And going over the story again with him, there were a few changes in it, but none that couldn't be accounted for by his condition. We got the address of the bar where he'd met Stubby. We checked with the doctor, and he told us that both boys had been given a powerful corrosive poison. He went on to say that it was a miracle that Jack Walker was still alive. 9.26 p.m. Frank and I drove back to Los Angeles. We checked into the office and ran the name Stubby through the moniker file in R&I, but we found nothing. We got out a local and an APB on the description and the name. The stats office started to run on the M.O. Frank and I checked the hotel on 5th Street, and the manager showed us the room, but he said that it had been cleaned and occupied since the two Marines had left. Leighton Prince went over the room but failed to come up with anything. We took the hotel registration card and booked it in as evidence. The man had signed his name as Alton Richards. The manager gave us the same description as the one we'd gotten from the Marines. We ran the name through R&I, but we failed to come up with any new leads. There'd been no replies to the broadcast, and the staff's office had finished the run and had come up with four possible suspects. These were checked out, but they led us nowhere. 2.30 a.m., we checked the bar, but we found it was closed. Wednesday, 8.14 a.m., we briefed Captain Lorman on the developments, and then we went over to again check the bar where the two Marines were supposed to have met Stubby. The place was deserted except for one man drinking a beer. The waitress was sitting in a rear booth, filing her fingernails. Frank and I went back to talk to her. Yeah, something you want? Well, police officers, miss. We'd like to talk to you. Cops, huh? Yes, ma'am. This is my partner, Joe Friday. My name's Smith. Smith? <laughs> Boy, does that sound phony. Here's my ID card. Yeah, it's Smith, all right. What do you want? Do you mind if we sit down? No, go ahead. Live. Thank you. What's this all about? Do you work here steady? Yeah, most of the time. What's your name, miss? Vera. Vera Gay. Well, Miss Gay, were you working here around the 8th, the 9th, or the 10th of July? Yeah, and you can make it Vera. Mm-hmm. You know most of the people who come in here regularly, do you? Yeah, I suppose so. I wonder if you'd look at this description and tell us if you know the man here. W-M-A. What does that mean? White male American. Yeah, W-M-A. 36 years, 5 feet 7 to 5 feet 9... 155-pound stubby. Yeah? Yeah, I know him. Comes in here all the time. Nice guy. Loud when he gets drunk. He's always nice to me, though. Tells me I should be in pictures. You know, the movies? Yes, ma'am. Have you seen him today? No. He hardly ever gets in before maybe noon, one o'clock. It just doesn't bother you, does it? Am I following my nails? Not at all. 
He does bother some people, you know. Mm. Like running a piece of chalk down a blackboard. Miss Stubby, does he have any other name? Did you know it? Yeah, Paul Rogers. That's another one, Joe. Yeah. And you want to go ahead, miss? Yeah, I went out with him a couple of times, finally gave it up. I couldn't go that route. What's that, ma'am? All he talked about it was either him and the Marine Corps and what a big hero he was, or else how he was going to get me in pictures, you know, movies. Yes, ma'am. I didn't come out to California to get in the movies. Well, I came out to be a private secretary, only those jobs are a little hard to get, so I work here. Make enough for coffee and cakes. And when a job comes along, I'll take it. Work in a big office, nice boss. Who knows, he might even marry me. Well, that movie hokum for me, no, sir, and not your little Vera. Did you work on the night of the night? It's night before last. Let's see. Yeah, I was in. You happened to see the stubby Rogers that night? Well, I got to think about that. Let's see. That was the night we had the fight just before closing. Yeah, he was in earlier. You happen to notice if he was with anybody? What's it all about? He do something you want him for? No, we just like to talk to him. Yeah. Well, if he did anything, we had nothing to do with it. This is a good place. We got nothing to do with the people who come in. We got the price of a drink, they get served. We don't ask for trouble. Oh, we aren't going to cause any trouble, miss. We just want to talk to this Rogers. Yeah, well, as long as we aren't running into it. Do you remember if he was with anyone? Yeah, he was with a couple of Marines. Left with him, had a beef with Sam. He's a night bartender. Complained that the drinks were too high. I don't know what he was crying about. He's been drinking here a long time. Never had problems before. You saw him leave with these two Marines then? Yeah, the three of them walked out. I think, actually, they sort of floated out. The two kids were really boiled. You remember what time it was when they left? Oh, that'd be kind of hard to tell. We were pretty busy. It was pretty important, miss. Well, let me think. I guess maybe around 8, maybe 8.30, around in there. Just a guess, though. Do you have any idea where this Rogers lives? Yeah, I've been there a couple of times. Hotel on South Hill. Mm-hmm. Can you give us the address? Yeah, I got it in the purse. Yeah, I should have known he was a phony. All we'd say, and I thought he could get me in pictures, you know, in movies. Yes, sir. Well, don't come that way. Of course, you understand I didn't come out here to get in pictures. I came out to be a private secretary. Here's the address. Here, keep it. I won't be using it anymore. All right, thank you, Miss Kay. Here's our card. If you think of anything more you think we ought to know, we'd appreciate a call from you. Yeah, thanks. Sure appreciate your help. Well, you never know. Maybe I'll need your help sometime. Matter of fact, you might be able to lend me a hand. What's that, miss? You know any picture producers? You know, movies. Frank called the name Paul Rogers into the office and a supplementary broadcast and an APB were gotten out. A stakeout was arranged on the bar. We went back to the city hall and a check through R&I on the name Paul Rogers netted us nothing. We drove over to the hotel on South Hill. The manager told us that Rogers was not in his room. He went on to say that Rogers had not been using his room regularly for the past week or so, but that he had been in a couple of days before in the company of a soldier, and that as far as he knew, the soldier was still in. In the company of the manager, Frank and I went upstairs. The manager unlocked the door and we went in. Minimum, Frank, there's someone in bed. Yeah. Come on, you. How about it? Just a minute. How about it, Joe? I don't know. He's dead. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. And now a report every smoker should hear. Nose, throat, and accessory organs not adversely affected by smoking Chesterfields. First such report published about any cigarette. A responsible consulting organization reports a study by a competent medical specialist and staff on the effects of smoking Chesterfield. For six months, a group of men and women smoked only Chesterfield, 10 to 40 a day, their normal amount. 45% of the group have smoked Chesterfields from 1 to 30 years, for an average of 10 years each. At the beginning and end of the six months, Each smoker was given a thorough examination, including x-rays, and covering the sinuses, nose, ears, and throat. After these examinations, the medical specialist stated, It is my opinion that the ears, nose, throat, and accessory organs of all participating subjects examined by me were not adversely affected in the six-month period by smoking the cigarettes provided. Remember this report, and buy much milder Chesterfield, regular or king size. Wednesday, July 11th, 12.40 p.m. We called the coroner's office, then we got in touch with the crime lab and the photographers. After the pictures had been taken, the body was removed. The victim was a soldier in his mid-30s. 
On the nightstand beside the bed, we found an empty pill bottle and a suicide note. The note was booked as evidence and turned over to Don Meyer for comparison with a handwriting taken from the hotel registration card that Rogers had signed. The men from Leighton Prince went over the place thoroughly. They came up with several classifiable prints. Fingerprints found on the bottle belonged to the victim. There were several other sets in the room which were not identified. The crime lab went over the room, and then they went back to the lab to make their analysis. All officers in the area were alerted to be on the lookout for Rogers. Frank and I talked to the manager of the hotel, a Henry Corey. He told us that Rogers had lived in the hotel for the past four and a half months. He said that Rogers was quiet, kept pretty much to himself, and for the most part was a good tenant. He said that on several occasions, Rogers had gotten behind in his rent, but that he'd always managed to come up with the money. The manager told us that in the conversations he'd had with Rogers, the main topic had been the Marine Corps and the suspect's record overseas. Rogers presented himself as an armchair general, constantly calling down the way the situation was being handled. He would refer to his own exploits, but when questioned about his leaving the service, he became vague and evasive. Additional handwriting samples were obtained and sent to Meyer. The manager told us that the latest victim had come in with Rogers the night before and that at the time he'd been pretty drunk. They'd gone upstairs, and when Rogers had left in the morning, the manager had assumed that the soldier had gone the night before. 3.20 p.m. Frank and I went back to relieve the steak out at the bar. Back again? Yes, Miss Gay. Sit down. Thank you. It seems like every time I see you, I'm doing something with my nails. This morning, filing them, now I'm filing them again. I'm going to put polish on them after this. I guess you think I'm pretty vain. No, not at all, miss. New color called Frosted Rose. and pretty? Uh-huh. Kind of iridescent, is what the label says. To sprinkle your nails with stardust. Yes, ma'am. It's a pretty bottle, too. They sure put things up nice nowadays. Uh-oh, here comes your boy. That's Rogers. Yeah. Yes, Stubby, one of the beans. Bourbon, Coke. How's it going, Stubby? Same old six as before. Yeah, pretty dull. Yeah, you're doing a great business. Ah, oh, it's early yet. Here's your drink. It'll be four bits. There you go. All right, thanks. Good. All right, Frank, let's go. No trouble now. Not unless he makes it. Hi, fellas. Something you want? You Paul Rogers? Yeah, who are you? Police officers. We'd like to talk to you. I don't want any trouble in here. No, there's not going to be any trouble. Always fights. Why is it everybody comes into a bar and starts fights? Ain't there someplace else to be? All right, come on, Rogers. Well, four. You got nothing to hold me in. We'll talk to you about that, too. Well, let me finish my drink. No, afraid not. Let's go now. Look, I said I was going to finish my drink. Don't lean. Let's can it, mister, and go. I said I was going to finish my drink. (laughs) All right, mister, on your feet. (laughs) Nothing on him. Let's take him to the office. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Thanks. Sure appreciate it. Well, what's that? Thought for a minute there you were going to have a fight. We took the suspect back to the city hall. Then we checked the name through the Marine base in San Diego. Lieutenant Richard Houston called back to say that Rogers had received a court-martial and a dishonorable discharge in January of that year. He'd been tried by a military court on the charge of stealing alcohol from the hospital pharmacy and selling it to the patients in the hospital. We stopped in handwriting analysis, and Don Meyer took an exemplar of the suspect's writing. When we checked by the office, there was a message from Sergeants Bill Cummings and Harry Hanson stating that their investigation had shown that the death of the soldier in Roger's room was suicide beyond any doubt. 7.46 p.m. Frank and I talked to the suspect in the interrogation room. Terrible thing, treating a veteran like this. All right, let's save it, Rogers. There's a few questions we'd like some answers to. I got nothing to hide. All right, what were the conditions of your discharge from the Marine Corps? What do you mean? Did you get an honorable discharge or a dishonorable discharge? I had a little trouble. Lousy officers never did understand what the problems of the enlisted man were. What do you do for a living, Rogers? I work. Where? Around. You have a steady job? What do you mean, steady? One you've held for, say, more than six months? Haven't been out of the service that long. Where'd you serve in the Corps? Japan, Korea. How long were you there? About four or five months. Why'd you come back? I was wounded. How? What do you mean, how? Just that. How were you wounded? Well, I wasn't exactly wounded. I had my feet frostbit. Mm-hmm. According to this here, you went AWOL and got lost. When they found you, your feet were frozen. Is that right? What's that you got? Your record in the Corps. You got a lot of nerve digging into that. Just what do you got me in here for anyway? I done nothing that puts me in line for this kind of treatment. You know a couple of Marines named Ed Monahan and Jack Walker? Monahan? Walker? No, I don't think I know. You ever register in a hotel on Fifth Street? No, I live over on Hill. You know a soldier named Marty Wilkin? What's he got to do with it? We found him dead in your room. You're cracking up. Yeah, sure, Rogers. We just dreamed we found that body. Got nothing to do with him. Met him in a bar. He said he wasn't feeling too good. Said he didn't have a place to sleep. I let him have my room. Something wrong in that? 
Be a little kind, and now even that gets you in trouble. You sure you don't know a Marine named Ed Monahan? Positive. There's something wrong, Rogers. Girl at the bar says she saw you leave the place with two Marines. They could have been Monahan and Walker. Well, maybe I know them. I might and still not know their names. You didn't take them up to a room you'd rented in a hotel on 5th Street? No, I told you once I never lived on 5th. Checked with our handwriting man. He says your writing matches some samples we found on the hotel register. Maybe I write like somebody else. No, we don't think so, mister. How about Jack Walker? Maybe you know him, you just didn't remember him. No, I keep telling you, I don't know them. Vera says you do. Well, she's lying. Is she? Sure she is. She's trying to save her own skin. From what? She doesn't want to stand a rap for murder, can't you see? Yeah, go ahead, Roger. I'm saying nothing until I see my lawyer. You sure you don't want to tell us why I did it? I got nothing to say. Makes it tough, Rogers. What do you mean? Just makes it rough, that's all. Looks like you're going to have to stand a murder rap. Yeah? It's the way it looks. Well, I didn't mean it. I didn't. I just wanted to get even. That's all. Just get even. For what, Roger? For the way the court treated me. Kicked me out. I didn't do anything really wrong. Cop a little alcohol. That's all. No harm done. They look at it a little different. Yeah, that's a trouble. Stinking brass. They're all alike. They don't care what happens to us. The guys in the field. I tried to get a job. I looked everywhere. I just didn't fit. Seemed like everywhere I went, I got into trouble. I wanted like it was when I first went in. Like it was after boot camp. Walking down the street, girls looking at you. A Marine. A big man. They took that away from me. They wouldn't let me enlist again. I tried, but they wouldn't let me. You can understand what that would do to a guy, can't you? I don't know. Well, it tore me apart. Right then, I decided I could even all the stinking gyrenes in the world. They wouldn't let me in, and I hated them. Yeah. Remember what happened the day you gave the two boys the pills, do you? Sure, I remember all of it. Oh, they cried for a medic. They weren't big men then. No, sir, they sure weren't. All right, Rogers, we'll get a stenographer. Tell me, Sergeant. Yeah. Did I get both of them? No, Walker's going to be all right. He the young one? That's right. A real nice kid. Lucky, too. Is that right? Yeah. No worries. Really got it made. Uniform, that's what does it. Uniform makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, well, don't worry. You'll get one. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 13th, trial was held in Department 87, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. In modern crime detection, the working detective depends on scientific research. He relies on the services of trained experts in ballistics, communications, fingerprints, to name just a few. He's interested only in facts. And as a smoker, you should be interested only in facts. That's why the report you heard earlier is so important to you. Nose, throat, and accessory organs not adversely affected by smoking Chesterfield. First such report ever published about any cigarette. Remember it. And next time, buy Chesterfield. Regular or king-size, premium-quality Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. <laughs> Rogers was tried and convicted on one count of murder in the first degree. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Virginia Gregg, Jack Crucian. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Sound off for Chesterfield. Either way you like them, regular or king size, Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Much milder Chesterfield. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Tonight, it's Barry Craig, confidential investigator on NBC.